Thank you very much and, and welcome to this virtual visit to the Virgo Observatory. So my name is Fyodor Sorrentino. I'm a researcher of the Italian Institute for Nuclear Physics. So uh, I'm gonna show you uh, this observatory with a few prototypes to explain how the detection of gravitational waves work and what kind of problems we have to deal with. And, and by the way, walking around the, the observatory can tell you something more uh, about gravitational waves uh, that we already heard about this morning. So, you know, gravitational waves are ripples in the space time that have been predicted by uh, Albert Einstein about one century ago in his uh, general uh, theory of the general relativity uh, and the effect of these gravitational waves, which are generated by events. Uh, in the far distant the universe is to uh, have the space time to uh, wobble, to oscillate. This means the distance of objects, lengths are oscillating when a gravitational wave passes through. And uh, this change of distance is extremely tiny. It's, it's very small. So it's less than uh, uh, one part in 1000 of the radius of, of a proton, which is a, 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 you know, a, an elementary particle inside the atom. So it's extremely difficult to detect those uh, waves, uh, although this is extremely interesting because it brings uh, very useful information about, uh, about the universe. So it's a completely different kind of observation of the universe than looking at optical, uh, optical light that comes to, to us. But how difficult it is? Well, you know, very tiny distances to be to be to be measured uh, require extremely uh, sensitive instrumentation. And the best instrument we have to measure lengths is by laser interferometry. So here I show you uh, a small prototype of, of a, the Virgo machine, which is a giant interferometer. So what is an interferometer? Well, it's it's made like that. So we have a, a, a laser. A laser beam, here you see a small laser, you see the red light that comes out of the laser, and the laser beam uh, is, is split in two parts with this, this mirror. This mirror is, we call a beam splitter. It transmits half of the light and reflects half, half of the light, 90 degrees. So we have the light traveling to different orthogonal path. At the end of each arm, the light is reflected back by a mirror. So two mirrors are sending back the light. And so the two beams are combining again inside the beam splitter. And again, half of the light is transmitted through the laser and the other half is reflected off. So what happens when the two beams combine in, uh, well, in this output uh, branch of, of the interferometer, you see the two beams are uh, producing these fringes of light. And the reason for that is that Depending on the travel that the, 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 the light is, uh, is traveling and the, the, the path that the light is traveling, the two beams might have different position of maximum and minima because a laser field is nothing else than an electromagnetic wave. So a wave is oscillating and there are two waves that are oscillating. So depending on the position of maxima and minima of the field of the light, they can interfere. That is, they can either sum, um, sum up to, to improve the intensity or they just can destroy each other. They cancel out if the phase difference is there. So this is a sensitive instrument. Looking at the fringes it is a sensitive instrument to understand what is the difference in the changes in the differential uh, path lengths. So it's a very uh, tiny, uh, sensitive instrument with kind of a ruler, which has the path of the wavelength of a laser. In the case of Virgo, we use so what you see here is the red light, or we use infrared light in, in, in Virgo, which is not visible, and the wavelength is one micrometer, that is one millionth of a meter. Reason why you see bright and dark spots there that are moving is because the distance of the mirrors are moving any time we just uh, touch the ground. I'm touching the ground now and it's moving uh, a lot because very small vibrations are seen by this uh, instrument. And you see 
uh, dark and uh, bright uh, spots because, well, the two beams are a little bit tilted. So this means in different positions, you see the waves are interfering uh, constructively. In other places, they are interfering destructively. So uh, this, this device, so it's very sensitive, but at the moment you see it's very sensitive also to what we call noise, seismic noise or acoustic. So if I speak also the air that is um, along the path of the laser is vibrating and this is also producing changes in the position of this, of this spot. So, so, so it means that if we actually want to, to measure very tiny uh, changes in the length due to the gravitational wave, we have to isolate our interferometer from the ground motion or from air turbulences. So we need uh, some technological effort to do so. So before moving to show you how we do that, let me show also uh, the idea of the Einstein theory of general relativity. So if you, the idea is that, so space time, actually gravity is equivalent like to, to, to a, a change in the geometry, meaning that if I have a mass and if the space time is kind of the fabric, an elastic fabric, the mass is producing a deformation in the fabric. So without any mass, the space is a, is, is a flat fabric and a, a light mass will, a light body will, will move straight while if we have a, a a uh, tight mass. So this will uh, produce a deformation in the geometry. And this deformation is the reason why the mass uh, going nearby will, will not go straight, but we, it will move on, uh, on ellipses or so. So, you know, the idea is that uh, so th th there's kind of equivalence between um, gravity and, and the geometry of the space time. And uh, if, you, if you go further with this equivalence, then you can understand that if you have sudden changes in the mass distribution, like, like when you have a collapse of two waves, one to each other, then you move this uh, fabric quickly and, and there are some ripples that you can see in the fabric that will propagate. And this is what uh, the origin of gravitational waves. So when I say we need to isolate our extremely sensitive a machine from the ground is, uh, you know, uh, that the ground is always moving. This is what we call seismic noise. So whatever, even in the absence of, our, of any earthquake, you will always see that uh, the, the, the ground has small vibrations due to either uh, human activities or just uh, propagation of, uh, of vibrations around all the, 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 the earth, uh, the earth uh, sphere. And uh, so we need to have that the optics of our instrument are well isolated from ground. The idea for isolation, for extreme isolation of the motion of this optic from the ground is what we call a super attenuator. Here I can show you a prototype of, of a super attenuator. The idea is based on, on a simple uh, mechanical filter that is a, a simple pendulum. So if you have a pendulum, so you suspend an object, a mass on, on a wire, then what happens if you move the suspension point? So if you have a, small, a slow movement, then the suspended mass will, will just follow. But if you move fast, you see that the, the pendulum is, is, is reducing the motion in the suspended mass. And this happens when you move faster than faster than the oscillation of the pendulum. So this is oscillating, say, twice a second. If I, if I move 10 times a second, yeah, okay. Then this will move much less. So the idea of a super attenuator is to put several pendula, simple pendula, in cascade, one after the each other. So I suspend another pendulum here. And after I do this a few times, I can show that I'm able, for instance, to um, reduce the motion of the ground on the on suspended mass by more than a, a billion time. So indeed, we, we, we do that a million of a million times. So if the ground is moving at 10 Earths, 10 oscillation per time, then the suspended mass after six mechanical filters will, will move a million, million times less. 
Um, so it's not enough for us to uh, reduce the, the horizontal motion uh, that is just to have pendula. We also want to reduce the vertical motion. And this is why this, each stage of this pendulum here is, is also a vertical, uh, a vertical spring. In the first prototype you see here, this spring is done with compressed air. Nowadays we use metal, uh, metal springs, which are more robust, uh, more efficient. And why do we need also vertical uh, uh, isolation? That is, we don't want also the mirrors to move vertically. After all, in principle, we have the two mirrors. The light is propagating al along the horizontal. So we want to see what well, the effect of a gravitational wave as changes in the distance between the mirrors. Why do we care about vertical motion? And the reason is simple. It's just because the Earth is not flat. So we have our interferometer, it's giant uh, optical uh, interferometer. So we have the mirrors are separated by three kilometers. This means that each mirror sees a different vertical and the verticals are not parallel on the ground. So if we have vertical motion, this also means that the distance between the mirrors will change a little bit. Uh, so one millimeter change in the vertical will correspond roughly to one micrometer in change of their distance. And it's too much for us. So we have also to isolate the vertical motion. What's very interesting is the very uh, last stage of this uh, um, uh, suspension system. And here I show you a more recent prototype. That's what we call the payload. So the piece of glass that you see there is our, one of our mirrors, one of the mirrors of the optical interferometer. But it doesn't really look like a mirror, it just looks like a transparent piece of glass. But if you see more carefully, there's a coating on one of the surfaces, and this is making the mirror highly reflective for infrared light. As I told you, we use an infrared laser, and at this wavelength, the mirror will be okay. Uh, the light, or I'm just uh, reading your, your question, so the light follows a circular path due to gravity well. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the, the light is actually, well, well, there's an effect of gravity on the light, and this is, and this is true. But on this distance of three kilometers, this is basically negligible. So the, 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 the curvature of, uh, of the, uh, of the light path due to the gravity is actually something that we are not sensitive to in this experiment. So basically the main problem here is we, uh, we just have that the, the, the mirrors, uh, the, 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 the gravity is not parallel on the, on the location of the two mirrors. So if you have that uh, mirror is moving vertically, just also the, the two mirrors are changing their distance. But the light, it, for, our, for our system, we can assume that the light is actually propagating over stray light because the curvature due to gravity is, is extremely small in our case. Uh, in other experiments, this is, this is not negligible. So, um, uh, so going back to our mirror, so this is uh, the, the piece of glass so as a coating on one side, and you see that the mirror is suspended and the way we control the, the, the position of the mirror is through this uh, mechanical uh, object, which is a marionette that is uh, used to, to, to be able to tilt the, the suspended mirror on, on all the, the usable directions or also move transversely uh, or axially. So we can align our interferometer by moving this marionette and we also can tune precisely the position of the mirrors. Uh, we, don't, we, we, we not only suspend the mirror, we also suspend a, a counterweight, this metal stuff around the mirror is completely separated from the mirror itself and is suspended independently. And this is uh, uh, our, um, our actuator for fast movements of the mirror. You see that uh, on the back side of the mirror, we have very small white pieces so these are magnets that are glued on the, on the back side of the mirror. And on the counterweight, we also have the, the, some uh, electrical coils where we can run some, uh, flow some electrical current. Anytime we, 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 we flow some current in a coil, 
there's a magnetic field that is acting on the magnet. So this is a way to uh, uh, apply a force on the mirror without touching it. So we can tilt the mirror with respect to the counterweight in, in all position. We can also push. And so this is a fast actuator for the mirror that is not introducing additional noise as we do not touch it. What's also very interesting is the way we suspend this mirror. If you have a closer look, then you will see that the wires to suspend the glass mirror are not the same kind of material as the wires to suspend the, the metal counterweight. Indeed, the wires for the mirror are made of glass. So the same material as the mirror. And the, the reason for that is that um, with our extreme sensitivity, we will also feel the so-called thermal noise, that is the thermal uh, movement of, uh, of the microscopic structure of the material. And this is much less than the movement, uh, thermal uh, um, uh, random movement of particles in, in, a, in a metal. So that's why we have to use glass. So we have these tiny fibers, half of the, less than half of a millimeter in diameter that are holding uh, a large massive mirror, which is 40 kilograms in, in weight. Okay, so uh, we can move on. Uh, while we move on, you can also ask questions. So I, uh, I'm going to, to show you now a uh, part of the machine. And in particular, we will start by looking at the tubes where the light is propagating over three kilometers. In going there, there's a chance we lose a bit of the Wi-Fi connection, but uh, don't worry, it will only take a couple of minutes to go there. So while we walk, you can ask questions and would be happy to, to answer. We zijn even buiten bereik van het internet in Italië, maar dat zal zo weer terugkomen. Als iemand intussen een vraag heeft, uh, stel die inderdaad vooral het zijn in de chat. Het zijn je hardop. Nou, dat van een experiment van drie kilometer groot is natuurlijk ook dat je een eind moet lopen van één stuk naar het andere stuk. Here we go again. Hope you can hear me. Yes. Welcome. Very back. good. There was so, a question in the meantime. Um, did you want me okay. to ask that? Yes, someone please. Asked, someone asked, uh, how do the fluctuations in the temperature of the whole structure uh, affect the performance? Okay. The temperature fluctuations do matter. Uh, mostly uh, the, the, the problem is that the temperature fluctuation actually will change the position of the, the, the base of the structure, so they will tend to change the length so, or produce misalignments. So the point is we have to keep those temperature changes as low as possible. So the area where, um, where the core optics are located are, are controlled in temperature to better to, to something like one tenth of a degree. And then residual fluctuations, uh, fluctuations are compensated by active control. So this, uh, this machine is actually a giant uh, servo, servo control um, 
yeah, uh, automatic control machine where we have a lot of servo loops that are controlling uh, the relative position and, uh, and, and orientation of, of all of the suspended optics. I will show you there are many optics in this interferometer, more than in the, in the small prototype that I show you. And all of them are suspended. So we have to, to, to act with proper sensing on all of the degree of freedom of the optics. And we do this uh, with automated loops. And we, uh, these loops are also uh, compensating these temperature fluctuations. Uh, now, uh, now what you see behind me is a, a big tube. This tube is three kilometers long and it's propagating along the east-west direction. We have another similar tube, uh, orthogonal to this, propagating to, from the south to the north. And uh, uh, inside those tubes, uh, the laser beam is, is, is traveling from uh, the beam splitter to the, the mirror, which are located at uh, the end uh, stations of this uh, interferometer. Uh, these tubes are actually uh, evacuated because we need to uh, avoid the, 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 the effect of, of um, the, the air on, on the propagation of the light. So propagation of the light feels also the refraction of the, of, of the air. So we pump out all of the air and indeed, uh, we, 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 we need an extremely low residual pressure. So this, um, these tubes are uh, in ultra high vacuum condition. It is something like 10 power minus nine millibar. It's a, it's a very, very small pressure. And indeed Virgo is the largest ultra high vacuum system in Europe in terms of, uh, of overall volume that we keep in this low uh, pressure. And um, yeah, larger than this, we only have the, 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 the sister machines that are, that are located in the US, the LIGO Observatory. Um, so uh, what I, can, I am touching right now is not really the vacuum tube. This is an external protection. Um, it's a kind of a thermal shield for the tube. So this tube, uh, or oh, about the temperature fluctuations. So the tube also is experiencing uh, thermal uh, expansion and compression when due to the daily and, and, and seasonal change of the temperature. So these three kilometers is actually done in sections, many sections of 30 meters each. So you see, perhaps we can go here and see that uh, each, each piece of tube is, is joined to another piece with a bellow. So this is, uh, this is actually the steel of the vacuum. Part. This bellow is used to, to, to account for the, the compression or extension due to the thermal, uh, thermal expansions of, of the tube. And all of this stuff here is heaters. So uh, from time to time, we need to heat up all the, 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 all the metal of this uh, vacuum tube. That's why the color you see here is brown, because this piece of still has undergone um, um, baking, uh, baking process. So we, we bro brought it to above 200 degrees for a few weeks. And this is uh, done to, um, uh, to push all the water from the inner walls uh, of, the, of the tubes away so that we, so that we cannot, uh, so in the end we can have a much lower pressure and a very good vacuum. Okay. Uh, I think we can now go to another location that is the core of uh, the Virgo interferometer. And now for sure we will lose the connection for a while. So I would say see you in uh, three or four minutes. Thank you. We wachten af tot de verbinding weer terugkomt. Als mensen intussen vragen bedenken, dan kun je die natuurlijk weer in de chat zetten. In elk geval mooi weer daar in Italië. 
extra reden om natuurkundige te worden. Dan kom je op dit soort mooie plaatsen. Nou Marcel, als je dat van het mooie weer in de folder zet om studenten te lokken, dan zeg, geef ik samen leerlingen. Kijk, zullen we zeker doen. <laughs> de folders van de UvA hebben ook een foto van een prachtig zonnig science park overigens, maar dat is helaas niet elke dag zo. Je hebt natuurlijk niet zo heel veel aan zonnig weer als je anderhalf meter onder de grond zit, hè, denk ik. Maar goed. Dat is waar. Dan zou ik kunnen zeggen, dat laten we dan de PhD-studenten doen. En als wetenschappers, euh, oudere wetenschappers blijven we lekker boven de zon zitten. Maar dat is niet altijd het geval. <laughs> maar die hebben ook meer vitamine D nodig, moet je maar denken. Ja. Uh, Marcel, wat mij hier ook wel aan, ik schreef het net ook in de chat, ik bedoel, we, we, we willen graag studenten, uh, leerlingen triggeren om een beta vak te gaan doen. Maar dat is breder dan alleen fysica, want als ik ook hier zie wat er aan engineering en aan materiaalontwikkeling en aan werktuigkundige constructies gedaan moet worden, ook zeg maar ontwikkeld, gewoon vanuit het niets, vanuit scratch on gedaan moet worden, voor zo'n ding er staat, daar is ook heel veel kennis en, en hoogwaardige kennis en, en knappe koppen voor nodig. Zeker, zeker. Dus het is, een heel uh, bedrijf op zich met inderdaad ingenieurs en ook, ook mensen ja. die politiek moeten bedrijven soms. Uh, ja, naast ja en dat, dat is ook wel iets denk ik om aan leerlingen mee te geven. Het is meer dan alleen die, die fascinerende fysica waar je aan de grenzen van de kennis uh, uh, werkt, maar ook het faciliteren daarvan door die andere dingen, die, die engineering en der, vooral denk ik dan. Zit in ja. En ook daar wordt vaak aan de grenzen van de kennis gewerkt, hè? want het zijn vaak hele nieuwe ja. technieken ja. Die, die ook niet eerder ja. gebruikt zijn. Ja. En dat is wel heel leuk om te zien. Ik wou daar nog aan toevoegen dat een kennis van mij uh, bij de UvA, Erik Hennis, heeft nog heel hard gewerkt aan uh, het dempen van die trillingen met uh, omgekeerde slingers en diverse veerconstructies. En hij zei nog dat, uh, dat is vooral in de land van Amsterdam ontwikkeld. Amerika deed meer met activatoren en vanuit uh, UvA kwam dus meer de mechanische demping. En dat heeft hij uh, ook getoond bij diverse open dagen dus, uh, van, uh, van, van de UvA, het wetenschappelijk centrum. Kijk, ik zie dat Fjodor weer verbonden is. We moeten hem alleen weer even fullscreen krijgen. Oh, en weer weg is. So we are now uh, outside of, uh, of the main building, uh, the central building that is the, the core of, of the Virgo Observatory. Uh, before entering the building to show you the machine, would like to show you um, the large galleries from the outside. So what we see here is the Western gallery hosting the three kilometers tube. And, uh, and there's another one. Uh, uh, in the orthogonal direction in the Western Gallery. Entering the interferometer. We pass the an optical suspended resonator. So we have three mirrors and one of those mirrors is suspended at the very end of this gallery. And this is meant to clean up the, the laser beam. So to, to, to be able to send in the interferometer a really pure laser beam, nearly ideal, which is basically cleaned up in this suspended optical resonator. And uh, what you see, Ik 
als een stapje te ver uit het wifi bereikt. Might have lost, uh, you might have lost a little bit of, uh, of what I was saying about yes, the Yes, we, we heard the first half, the second half was out of reach. Sorry, okay, okay. We're okay. showing the tank for the liquid nitrogen and we use liquid nitrogen to keep part of our vacuum tubes at uh, very cold, at, uh, at the liquid nitrogen temperature. This helps to, um, yeah, to just to condense the uh, part of the residual buffer inside the, the uh, vacuum uh, tubes, and so to reduce the vacuum, the, the pressure. Okay, here we are inside uh, of, of the central interferometer uh, of the central building where uh, the core of the interferometer of the machine is, uh, is hosted. We will really enter beside uh, the, this window and show you the live. Uh, perhaps just a, 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 a close look at this simplified optical scheme will show you better what we are going to see. So this is a simplified um, scheme of the Virgo interferometer. Uh, and, um, and you see here we have a laser. And then this so-called mode cleaner cavity. We have been seeing the, the tube hosting this cavity. So we have a mirror at the end of this uh, gallery, 150 meters long. And this is meant to clean the laser beam. Then we also have some optics to, to avoid light to go back to the laser. And then we have a beam splitter that is uh, splitting the, the light in two parts. Then the light is traveling over these three kilometers uh, galleries and are reflected from these mirrors on the, on the final part. But also we have Additional mirrors. Okay. Okay, you can see them. So we have additional mirrors, which are which are meant to uh, allow the light to go back and forth our three kilometers uh, tubes several times. Indeed, we make the light go back and forth about five hundred times. This is to make our effective length of the machine like uh, 1,500 kilometers long. Um, and uh, it, this is not the whole story. We also have an additional mirror to avoid all the light to go back to the laser. So we increase the power that is reaching our detector. And we have some optics on the outer part to reach a photo detector that is telling us um, the differential length of the interferometer. So all of these optics are suspended from the ground uh, in different places. By the way, you can see here a picture, a modern picture of the super meter, where all of the mechanical filters are made with blades, metal blades that are uh, serving as springs. This is a very complex device because we need to control all the stages of this chain of mechanical filters. And, um, and here you see a, a, an aerial picture of the interferometer. So we are at the moment in this central building where most of the optics are, except the smoke cleaner mirror, and then the two end mirrors at the end of the galleries. All of the other optics that I show in the, in the, in the scheme are inside this this building where we are. So let's go inside on the terrace to show them from above. 
While we go, I can show you uh, a filter, a mechanical filter. So one of the pieces of the super attenuator where you can see these heavy mechanical blades that are holding a big weight and that are serving as a soft, so a soft uh, uh, mechanical spring to reduce the, the vertical motion. Okay, we go uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in the central area. We also need to um, keep away from dust. So all of our uh, science area is a, a, a giant clean room where we need to make sure no dirty stuff enters because dust can be uh, dangerous for uh, many reasons. So uh, dust can uh, spoil the uh, efficiency of the vacuum system, but also more importantly, it can produce uh, scattering on, on, on our optics. So stray light is a, a big source of noise in our, in our sensor. So the machine is operating uh, from time to time, either in science mode, that is detecting gravitational waves, uh, or in other periods, it's working for upgrades to improve the sensitivity. And the reason is that the technology that we use is, is continuously evolving. Oh, sorry, I think we need to turn on the light here. What is it? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. And uh, so the technology is com continuously evolving, and uh, uh, we need to upgrade our system to, to reach higher and higher sensitivity to be able to detect uh, more and more events from the, from the universe that are producing gravitational waves. Okay, what you see here is a number of uh, vacuum tanks. Each tank is, uh, is holding a super attenuator. And uh, so uh, oh, oh, the super attenuator is about 10 meters tall. And uh, so, you know, we have one super attenuator in the center for for the beam splitter. Then on, on my right side, we have the node input that is the mirror that is uh, making the, the light go back and forth the node tunnel several times in the far uh, away. Uh, and we have the west input mirror. We also have another tank here for a signal recycling mirror that is sending back the light before being the, uh, um, detected to increase the sensitivity. And then we have uh, a short tank. This is hosting a suspended optical bench with all of the optics which are necessary to uh, send the beam to the photo detector at the very end of our uh, interferometer. You see a lot of electronics nearby. They are controlling um, all the hardware in our in our observatory. So many of them are to to drive vacuum pumps, vacuum sensors. Many other are driving. Uh, the mechanical um, at, um, uh, actuators to, to for our very complex mechanical system for the isolators, um, super attenuators. Also, we have electronics for the photo detectors. We have a, a huge number of photo detectors to, to control, to be able to control um, the, um, our machine. And also we have a lot of sensors to understand and measure, continuously measure and characterize the environmental noise. So we're not only um, uh, worried about temperature fluctuations, but any kind of environmental change. That is either vibrations of the ground, although we isolate from that, but it's not, it's not always perfect. Vibration uh, in, in the air, that is sound waves, magnetic noise, electromagnetic noise, and so on. So we have uh, thousands of sensors that are uh, disseminated around our machine. And so we can characterize our, our noise background uh, very carefully. At the moment, we are uh, actually 
uh, in the phase of upgrade. So the Virgo machine started about 20 years ago to, to take data. It was built in the late 90s and uh, took data for a while. Then we upgraded it to a second generation and uh, the second generation started to take data in 2017. And this is when we started to detect really gravitational waves. And now we stopped. So we had an, a, um, another upgrade and then we, we, we stopped for, uh, for, for more than one year. And at the moment we are upgrading further. This is what we call the Advanced Virgo Plus uh, project uh, to further increase the sensitivity. Um, to better show you our um, needs to control this a very complex machine, I think the latest step of this visit will be in the control room of the intercom. So we will now walk back outside of this building. While we walk, I think I would be happy to, to answer further questions, if, if any. So we can go. I can ask a question for along the way. Um, if you if you were measuring right now, would it be possible to be in the places where you are? And... No, no, no. Uh, actually, uh, although uh, our super attenuators are extremely powerful, uh, human presence is, is not possible because uh, residual um, extra noise this is uh, due to just uh, human presence. We are working, so we produce vibrations and uh, we would uh, disturb the intercom. Uh, big, large disturbances like, uh, I mean, uh, groups of people walking around here would even uh, uh, make us lose the, the control of the machine. But otherwise, a single person walking around might be just producing a little bit of noise that the sensor will, uh, will feel. So in, uh, we're very lucky that we can visit now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's true. Oh, well, even in, uh, in uh, data, uh, in science uh, mode, we, we usually have some, uh, some uh, short periods uh, every week for maintenance, so for cleaning and uh, for refilling the ni uh, liquid nitrogen. So every, every Tuesday morning, we usually stop for, for a few hours. Uh, but otherwise, during science um, time and data taking, we, we acquire data so 24 hours, seven days a week, apart from a small, uh, small, uh, small periods of stop. And in this, in this situation, in principle, a single operator, a single person is able to run the machine with some uh, help from uh, experts of the different systems. And I will show you the control room where this is possible. Okay, just a, just a point, a request by ourselves. Uh, uh, there are probably some uh, questions in the chat. So if you want to translate us, uh, useful questions, we can answer. Yes, there, there was actually a question in Dutch, but it was also answered in Dutch by uh, Bas Winkel, so also is... Okay, okay, very good. Thank you. So we, yeah. Terwijl Fjodor weer een stukje wandelt, kan ik de vraag die in de chat was nog even voorlezen en het antwoord van Bas er ook bij. De vraag was, wordt er pas geconcludeerd tot een gravitatiegolf als er een andere detector is die ook gelijktijdig het signaal meet? En het antwoord is inderdaad, dat klopt. Uh, we meten normaal gesproken samen met de twee LIGO-interferometers in de Verenigde Staten. 
En als één van de interferometers maar een signaal ziet, dan weet je niet zeker of het een lokale verstoring is, alleen op die ene plek. Dus pas als ze alle drie tegelijk iets zien, dan weet je dat het echt is. En dan kun je ook nog de richting bepalen uh, door het verschil in de aankomsttijd van het signaal. Ja, die richting is belangrijk, want dan kunnen we tegen de telescopen zeggen uh, in welke richting ze moeten kijken. En, en dat is gebeurd in uh, uh, die detectie waar uh, Ralph Weijers het over had, waar al dat goud werd geproduceerd. In dat geval hebben de telescopen gevonden waar het is gebeurd. Okay, here we are. So last step in our uh, virtual visit is, um, is the control room of the Virgo Observatory. Andiamo una visitina, si può fare due chiacchiere? Okay. Ah, un meeting, okay. So, this, uh, this is the control room, and uh, this is where scientists and, and technicians operate the, the machine from remote. So we actually control all the parts of our machine and observatory remotely from here. And we send comments to, to act on the different uh, pieces of our hardware. And we monitor the status of our hardware through different, through different methods. So you see in the snapshot, we have a lot of uh, images that are showing cameras. Cameras are looking at laser beam at different position of, uh, of the interfront. And uh, also optical benches in some cases, where you can see uh, that laser beam is then several laser beam, beam that are bunching on different parts of these optical benches. So the shape of the beam on optics or on optical windows are telling us a lot of information about the status of our control of the machine. Also, we have other monitors where we monitor signals. As I told you, we need a lot of different information to be able to control all the degrees of freedom of our machine. So distance between the mirrors, relative orientation, and so on. But not only, also, environmental noise, so motion of the ground, pressure of the air, temperature, and so on. Uh, so we have a global view of the machine through our detector monitor system, that is the monitor, color monitor on the left half part. So each, each label there is showing a, a small part, a, a sub piece of, of a subsystem. So we have labels for injection laser, the labels for the sus suspend, uh, suspended optics, suspensions, uh, labels for environmental monitoring, and so on. And, uh, and then this is a just quick view to understand the status of the most meaningful uh, data that we, that we acquire. In practice, we acquire, as I, as I told you, thousands of signals and we elaborate them. So the control of the machine is also requiring a lot of computer memory, order of terabytes per day, and uh, and the way actually to to interact with the machine is to observe the data and then operate these feedback loops. So, for instance, a feedback loop is to have some optical signal from an optical sensor that is telling us the distance between two mirrors, and then yeah, we use this signal and we feed it back to the coils that are moving the mirror. So that we keep the mirrors, the two, the two, the two mirrors at a fixed distance that is necessary for operating the machine at maximum sensitivity. So during uh, upgrades, in particular during commissioning, that is what we are doing right now. There are many scientists sitting here and tuning different parts of the machine. And this will go on for several months until we, we actually catch control of the machine in, in the maximum sensitivity. 
and then we will be ready for acquired data. And in this case, when we acquire data, most of the time we will have a single operator sitting there and just asking for help in case, in case the, the machine goes out of the control, otherwise controlling him, himself machine with our feedback loops. Uh, before the commissioning time, we had a moment when we upgraded the hardware, so we installed some additional parts. Uh, and after that, actually, we will take several months, as I say, to, to, to operate the system, the new configuration. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to show you. So I'm still open to questions, but we can go outside as scientists here. I have and having a meeting to solve a few problems. Thank you very much. Very nice. One question that was asked online is, uh, how often do you see events? So it really, the frequency of the events really depends on our sensitivity. So during the last science run, what we call O3, this was the, the, the third observational period of the network of uh, gravitational observatories, the, the rate was about one event a week. No, it, it's even more, probably something like closer to two events per week. Uh, what we expect next time, that is, uh, we will start in less than one year probably, what we expect is to, to have uh, uh, twice the same rate, if not more. Actually, it really depends on the sensitivity that we will get. And when I tell, I say we detect, it means the network of observatories. So we have, so far we have the Virgo Interferometer Plus, the two American LIGO observatories. Next time we will also hopefully have a, a, another a Japanese uh, observatory in the game called Kagra. Okay. And then another question that was asked a bit earlier, how many people together are working to, to be able to do this experiment and, and how many of those are physicists and, and how many are okay so the well. Virgo collaboration is collecting at the moment nearly 700 people uh, scattered down several laboratories all over Europe uh, yeah many of them are Dutch in it uh, but uh, not all of them are physically here most of the time so the, uh, the, the machine, the, the observatory is, uh, is inside the so-called EGO, European Gravitational Observatory. This is a consortium with 50 employees, but plus uh, we have all the scientists in the collaboration. Many of them, I would say the majority would be physicists and other are most of them engineers. And, um, and uh, on average during commissioning time, you, you can see here something like a hundred of people on the site on average per day. Yeah, these are rock numbers. Thank you. Very far from a tabletop experiment. Yeah, um, but but still, but still much less than uh, high energy physics experiments like yes. like the CERN of yeah. Okay, thank you very much. If anyone else wants to ask a question in chat, then now is the time, or even uh, just unmute your mic if you want to ask something. I have a question, if permitted. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. In your talk a little bit earlier, you talked about stray light. That is a source of noise in your detectors. I have two questions about that. I suppose it's stray light from the laser source itself. And what is what measures are taken to minimize the influence of stray light? What do you do to avoid this as much as possible? Yes, indeed. Yeah, it's mostly light from the, 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 the main laser beam, which is extremely powerful. Yeah. And this laser beam, part of this laser light is scattered on yeah. any of the optics of, yeah. uh, of the machine, either the suspended op main core op peak optics or also on the, on, on the benches uh, that are collecting small parts of this light for the controls. So any, uh, any, um, any surface besides reflecting or transmitting can scatter a little bit of light and this light can travel, reach our detector to unwanted light. Mm -hmm. And so this produces noise. So basically the noise depends on, on, on two parameters. One is the amount of scattered light that is reaching the detector. And uh, the other part is the amount of motion of the optic that is scattering. 
because then uh, this will produce noise. If, 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 if the scatter, I mean, the path from the scatter to the, to the detector is changing, then also the amount of the, the signal produced by the, this light will, will move. And this is what we call noise. So we take action to both reduce the amount of light, of scattered light to reach the detector and to minimize the motion of the spectrum. So the, for the first task, all of the machines, all of the optical system is embedded with, uh, with shields, with baffles that are limiting. So these are absorbing glass or absorbing material that is uh, uh, minimizing the, 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 the probability for light to go from the scattering surface to the detector. So all the tube, for instance, is embedded with baffles, which are black. So the, in the very center, we have uh, the beam that is traveling is not uh, uh, stopped by the baffles. But if you have any scattering, this cannot actually, the scattered light will not reach the inner part of the tube, which are metal, and so not be reflected because of these baffles. So there are kind of disks which, which, with a hole inside for the laser beam. And in addition to that, we also suspend all of the benches that we, optical benches that we use to detect signals for the control of the interferometer. So it's not only suspending the mirrors, the big mirrors for the interferometer, but besides all of these mirrors, we also have an optical bench with a lot of optics on, on top of that, and they are also suspended and they are in back. So this was a major upgrade for the second generation detector that provided a, a, a real improvement in this technical noise. Yes, I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's about time we start to uh, wrap up our meeting, but I want to thank you, Fyodor, very much for showing us around. It was really nice. Uh, also, thanks to, I think it's Jada behind the camera. Yeah, yeah, it's Java in there. Yes. So thank you both for uh, for doing this and for allowing us to visit this this fascinating and big experiment. It was very nice. Okay. Thank you for visiting. Um, bye bye. <laughs>